Okay, so uh, uh, we will be talking about dynamical freezing and emergent conservation in interacting systems. So uh, you have many of you have heard this talk previously also, but it has still remained uh, uh, kind of enigma to us, and that's why I thought I'd share it among a broader audience. So today's talk was supposed to be delivered by Ushmi, but uh, Ushmi will deliver has hold has hold up um, <coughs> hold that for because she is uh, getting some new results which she would like to present, which is still oncoming. So I thought I will just uh, give the background stuff, which is uh, reasonably older, and then she can tell you the more recent results. So. So the idea is uh, what happens there are, if there are small quantities in your Hamiltonian. If you want to formulate statistical mechanics with quantities which are which do not commute with your Hamiltonian, that doesn't get into the statistical mechanics. For for example, for the Gibbs ensemble you have here out there just exactly conservation of that quantity. But there can be some cases where the conserv this uh, this commutation is not exactly zero, but very small. And in some cases, as we will show, see that this, this can give these quantities not only a long lifetime, but as we are seeing now, perpetual lifetime of, of their initial memory with some fluctuations. So it's not exactly conserved, but it's perpetually conserved. This can happen. If this happens, then formulating the statistical mechanics in its usual term becomes difficult. So uh, the question is uh, uh, whether such situations can appear. So in classical mechanics, of course, there are uh, uh, there is no commutation relation, but there is still ideas of conservation laws and integrabilities. So it's, it seems that if you break the integrability, you're, you, you still retain a little bit of memory of these things, unless you cross a threshold, which is the CAM threshold. But in quantum mechanics, there is no such threshold. So the question is whether, I mean, it has not proven that there is any such threshold. It cannot be proved easily because the symplectic structure of uh, statistical mechanics, cannot, uh, classical mechanics cannot be directly brought over to quantum mechanics. They have a metaplectic structure. But here, the question is uh, still whether this kind of threshold exists in equilibrium or non-equilibrium situations. That uh, bringing up a little bit of integrability breaking term or chaos doesn't really uh, make everything ergodic, and uh, uh, you can apply these kind of things fairly reliably, at least over very very long time scales. So, so everybody knows the use of uh, statistical mechanics. So, for generic systems, there is only one conservation law, which is energy. And uh, if energy is conserved, we blindly use this. We think in generic system, other than symmetries, if we take care of all the symmetries and go to the symmetry sector, which is, not, which is unrestricted otherwise, we expect we can apply these things uh, 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 without any hesitation. So here we minimally kill the energy conservation by a drive. So minimally in the sense that this is, uh, you drive it periodically. And the minimal, uh, in the sense that uh, energy is not conserved, but you can still have a effective Hamiltonian description, which is exact. So now we pose this question that killing energy conservation minimally, what happens? So there are the degrees of freedom which are interacting with each other, and you drive them periodically. And the question is, what happens? Whether it heats up and gives a very ergodic description, which will be very boring in this case because. Your even energy conservation is absent, so what you get is uh, basically complete mix, mixture of all kinds of uh, eigenstates of any local operator. So uh, if you look locally at this state, it will look like infinite temperature. So that is a conventional intuition, which is supported by various other uh, uh, other kinds of intuitions from quantum mechanics and assumptions of statistical mechanics that things will eventually heat up. For example, Fermi's golden rule. 
but we have recently seen that there are exceptions to that. So one kind of exceptions comes through, uh, which uh, Anadoli will now just object, okay, MBL. And the other kinds of things, I think I'll be able to convince at the end of the talk, as much more stronger numerical evidence of stability. So, okay, so the uh, simplest one possible, which where these questions were addressed first, I, to my knowledge, is this simple problem where there is a transfer sizing model and you drive the transfer field very strongly. So, above certain values of this. Uh, this drive amplitude, which were not studied carefully at the time, you see that it doesn't heat up uh, to infinite temperature like state, which in this particular kind of model would uh, amount to uh, heating up of the two level systems which you, with, to which you map this model after Jordan Wigner and uh, Fourier transform and half of partnership, half of occupation. It doesn't happen. So instead, they, if, if the probabilities were equal in both the states, like infinite temperature for each K mode, then magnetization would be zero. It doesn't happen for a very, very long time as we could simulate. So it's, it's, it has been uh, now tested for 10 to the power five, 15 cycles I'll go later. So uh, this remains con uh, conserved to some, uh, I mean, this average remains conserved around some value and it fluctuates around that, but it doesn't go to zero. If you plot these averages, they show a peak value structure, which can be analytically calculated with this. So this is exact numerics, which corresponds to infinite temperature, infinite time and infinite size. And, the anal and uh, uh, that's analytics and the numerics is for some large uh, size. I, I read just into the power four spins and some very large size. So the interesting thing is there is already an indication of a conserved quantity, which is emergent in the sense it was not present in the undriven Hamiltonian. And it is perpetual, at the same time, not exact. That's a very bothering thing for people who formulate statistical mechanics. So uh, first question is, when, when I did this work, first question was why it doesn't heat up? Because what stops it from absorbing energy? In a subsequent work, which Rodrich described today, yesterday, I, I'm not going to go there again. We can have extensively many periodically conserved quantities, which gives periodic law when it's interacting, when the system is non-interacting. But it doesn't explain why there is still, in addition to those exact conservation law, there is an, also an average experiment, I mean, ex, uh, approximate conservation law. So, uh, and of course, the obvious next question is what happens if you make it uh, interactive? So this problem was initiated by this first author because we had a paper which everybody likes and believes that if you drive interacting system is always heats up, which is which Rodrigo yesterday described as for thermalization, so KTH. So we didn't quite encourage her to do that, but she did it anyway. And then he discovered that this very interesting phenomena uh, of dynamical physics actually persists even in presence of interactions. So we will go step by step into the proof of this things that's actually stable. Uh, half of it I'll give and rest will be given by Oshman in her talk. So this is uh, now a uh, uh, Hamiltonian which has nearest neighbor X interaction, next nearest neighbor X interactions, and a small uh, symmetry breaking X field. And then uh, there is a transverse field, uh, this one, and there is a large drive field which, uh, which I'll just step. Uh, uh, following a, a square, square pulse kind of drive. The most interesting thing that comes out of it is there is a threshold. So if you increase your field, there is a sharp threshold below which it actually thermalizes pretty well. And the trend is pretty clear. The larger system thermalizes better, as you can expect. It can host, a bit, um, uh, I mean, uh, more kinds of fluctuations. And then up there, the trend suddenly changes. There is a cross crossing, but it's very, very noisy, so you cannot see that. So if you focus here, the trend exactly uh, reverses. So the uh, larger systems uh, freezes more strongly. And uh, so there is some kind of a crossing here, which you can roughly see if you do a log log plot. So the things that become sharper and sharper with system size, for example, this is L equal to 10, 
if this is l equal to 8 and this is l equal to 14, so it becomes sharper rather than moving away from this, uh, from the, away to the right, which is which could be a serious problem. Apparently, we did, don't see this in this particular case. So this work was uh, uh, a follow-up work of this was uh, done with uh, with Simonson here. And we found that it actually have, if you plot against the frequency, it actually have shows these peak valley structures and for pretty generic states. So we have the ground state of, of your initial Hamiltonian and a finite temperature density matrix, which we evolved these things. So both of them shows this peak very well. We wanted to try to uh, get in the uh, spectrum, entire spectrum, since this happens quite for quite high temperature states. If you look at this spectrum, so what we did is we uh, calculated this magnetization, which appears to be the conserved, conserved quantity, and plotted it for various uh, eggs basis states, which are the simultaneous eigenstates of the X Pauli matrices. And then, of course, for the degeneracies, you get these kind of steps. And we did the same thing for various Fluke eigenstates. And then these Fluke eigenstates. Uh, for those freezing peak values, they exactly coincide with this explicit state steps. You cannot distinguish them, they're not visible. But if you move away from the peak, of course, they uh, tend to smooth out and uh, tend to go to towards zero, which should be the flattest thing here. So if you go in the thermal regime, it is just zero flat. I forgot to show that here. So if you are below the threshold, it's just exactly flat and zero. So some structure starts developing, and at this peak, these things are absolutely distinguishable from the uh, uh, from the X basis uh, behavior, which says that the uh, Floke eigenstates have this magnetization as a good quantum number. So the idea is uh, the drive actually fragments the Hilbert space into the degenerate subspace of the conserved operator. But what happens inside this space, whether this completely thermalizes or not, is not clear. So actually, as you can see, this is not like this is not a scar-like phenomena. This actually affects statistical mechanics because you are breaking the entire Hilbert space into pieces. So then uh, uh, we saw these resonances. So there are certain points where this uh, freezing breaks down, and uh, this uh, happens when you tune one of these parameters. For example, this small, uh, tiny um, uh, longitudinal field. If you tune it. Certain values of this, for certain values of this uh, parameter, you, you just lose the thermalization. So these things drops, and with system size, it drops farther. So I, it believe, we believe that it goes to zero. That means the th thermalization occurs. And this happens for zero temperature as well as finite temperature initial states. So now we will just briefly describe some very interesting thing. First, the part of okay, perturbation theory, which was formulated by Dipananda. So he said that, uh, uh, let's take the uh, uh, X basis, all the terms in, in X, uh, Pauli X operator as our unparted Hamiltonian, which includes the time, time dependent part. Then your flow case states become uh, typical, I mean, trivially the X basis states, just they gather a phase because uh, uh, over one cycle, uh, they remain unchanged because everything is X and you're taking the eigenstate of the X basis. And then we see how, what the, this perturbation, this transverse perturbation does to these flow what, what what it gives to these flow So we followed the standard perturbation theory prescription. And then you get, in the first order, a term like this, which gives the initial state, uh, mth uh, component of the initial state, which will be a flow state in first order. And then we get a condition for, uh, uh, for the denominator to blow up. And that's the resonance condition for our theory, where the perturbation theory fails. And when we apply this to this particular model, then the miracle is it, it captures every single dip numerically obtained. So that's a, that's a clear surprise, because we can extend these things a little bit differently using Dyson series. And there will be further lines, which will correspond to two spin flip processes. These are just one spin flip processes, which fails here and gives these resonances. 
but there will be two spin free processes with a stronger uh, pole structure will uh, order so higher order pole structure which will be stronger divergence but that divergence is never found in the experiment that Lipton so theory somehow captures this uh, all of them and that's a mystery we do not know why because we simulated this thing in 20 spins there is nothing that stops and for infinite time practically infinite time because it's the diagonal ensemble and we also went for very very long time so there is no, nothing that stops them for flipping two spins, but uh, but that was not present. And if you are trying to, if you are thinking that uh, uh, two spins have a h square order of barrier, then you are wrong because the denominator is exactly zero. So it, you multiply h square with zero, it's always zero. So resonances are always dominant. I mean, whether whether the field is large or small doesn't uh, affect you much. So we very much would expect these things in the perturbation theory were entirely correct, I mean order by order, but that's what not we see. And then we did uh, a rotating frame Magnus expansion. This is very well covered in a uh, review by Anatoly and Marine, where they showed how to remove a large term which sits in the numerator uh, to get a reasonable uh, effective Hamiltonian which you can do Magnus expansion with. So we did the thing and then we got this, this kind of a, uh, uh, Hamiltonian in the moving frame. It's a non perturbative transformation. And you see H0x plus two, two different oscillating terms, but no large term in this Hamiltonian. So we can safely do the magnetic transformation for a large frequency. You do that, then a very interesting thing comes up. So in the first two orders, at those freezing points, all the term vanishes. And all the term vanishes irrespective of what kind of Ising interaction you put in. You can put those Ising spin in any dimensional lattice. You can connect them with any kinds of bonds you want. So it's completely independent of H0x. Whatever the H0x is, you get this freezing. So the first order, this two term disappears, indicating uh, leaving behind just the H0x part. So it's obvious to do. So this is consistent with our result, but it doesn't explain our result because entirely because our result has dynamics for states which are not, not in a small sectors of the uh, of the, uh, so it's just a conservation law. So it, it doesn't necessarily say all the X-basis states uh, in our, uh, our the numerics doesn't say all the X-basis states are conserved, but this would mean uh, all the X-basis states are conserved. So it is consistent, but it, it doesn't capture the entire thing. Unfortunately, we couldn't go beyond this uh, order because it's pretty complicated, but it was done also for Heisenberg model, which any arbitrary kind of Heisenberg uh, interactions, y, y, z, z, you can take in whatever you want. And you do this process, and in the first order, you get uh, an isotropic Heisenberg model, where you started with an isotropic one. So this also respects the magnetization conservation, and the second order term is zero. So we verified this numerically with various kind of Hamiltonians. So we found that uh, this is a list of Hamiltonians of Ising and uh, Heisenberg, which we tested this thing. And it seems the system size dependence of magnetization is basically completely up within size 20. So now I'm basically summarizing what Ushmi is going to tell. It's just an advertisement of our talk. What was done was we started with all kinds of X-basis state and evolved them for a very, very long time. And we got seven, eight cycles, right? Okay. How many cycles? 10 to the power of five cycles? Yeah. 10 to the power of five, six cycles, and we plotted the final entanglement, half chain entanglement entropy. And this shows this bizarre uh, structure. And what is interesting that even in the zero magnetization sector, where the large term doesn't prevent any kind of mixing because you flip two, you flip two spins, so there is no change in magnetization. Unless there is a mag change in magnetization, the large term doesn't cost any energy, charges any energy to you. Even then, there are many various kinds of states which, which have very, very low entanglement entropy. Basically, it doesn't grow, entanglement doesn't grow for several decades, which we can run. And then we can classify these things and just looking at them, uh, we found that these are actually the states whose dynamics are uh, prevented if we thought this guy is conserved. And then there are quadruplets 
which also do not so, so all they are all uh, bunched up here, which would uh, if this guy were conserved, this quadruplet wouldn't have any dynamics except between themselves. And that's exactly what we see. So we thought there are further conservation laws. And this is what uh, uh, the thing which we will describe in detail. So we, we found a way to uh, generate these conservation laws uh, and strong field just surrogate them. So if you suppose have a, a particular operator which commutes with a large term, which has a very small weight, you can see that. So here we measure this quantity which is basically the sum over the deviation of each locate state's uh, expectation value for one conserved quantity minus the exact value of this conserved quantity in X basis. And we sum them up for all of them and they divide it by the Hilbert space dimension because there are many of them. And then we call delta. So it's, it's a spectral deviation of the conservation law, how the conservation law deviates over the entire spectrum uh, from the, uh, for the Floquet eigenstate. And then if you in, introduce this guy in the Hamiltonian with a very small uh, coefficient, here is one very rough plot, that it rapidly increases and goes to zero, this deviation, which means you have to have this term very slightly in the Hamiltonian. You, this, this certainly doesn't uh, impose a large energy cost because the value at which this appears is like 0.2. So if you have kappa 0.2 in your Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian we're showing the next nearest neighbor, you start seeing this conservation law very strongly. So basically what we are trying to see, say is this a strong field gives you a, uh, a bed where you can inject a little bit of this seed of this conservation law. And that, that becomes a very, very strong uh, constraint for the entire dynamics over the entire spectrum. So this is the thing which, uh, which we will be talking about. So a lot of people, as you can see, uh, Shatnik and Onirban are here. Ushmi is of course here. Alex Vite could not come because of some urgent issues. Luke was a student. He's working on this. Frank Pullman is also involved. And of course, Rodish is always there as usual. So, okay. That's all. So what fits in the structure, what exactly fits in here is that you can put small things, small perturbations, and that can be, become very significant. And this cannot happen if you really believe the thermalization is directly linked to the divergence of many body series. So my guess is this is the high, the stability of this hides behind this uh, how to properly resum this divergence series. So for example, there are some ways uh, to do that, Borel Laplace transform, and then extract this function, you have to go to this resurgence theory, which are popular among the high energy physicists these days. Uh, so probably this, this was just saying that what we think divergence and divergent and eventually kills our processes are not that divergent actually. And in some right basis, which is very difficult to get, you will actually see a convergence series and explain this phenomenon. So that's it. Thanks, everyone. This is IACS, older one. And this is the spectrometer Raman used to get the fast Raman spectrum. So if you are not towards visiting, you can visit to just see this one. OK. So that's all. Thank you, Thank you very much. And for questions? I probably just missed a link somewhere, but initially you started off with quantities approximately commuting with the Hamiltonian. Sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So initially you started off with quantities approximately commuting with the Hamiltonian. Yes. And then you had this uh, emergent conserved quantity in the system. But I think I probably just missed the link between the two. Like, is this an example of that? And could you like clarify yeah. like how so you have it a very large term which commutes with these guys? So you might if you divide this large the whole thing by this large term, 
then the commutators of those terms with the with the rest will be small in that sense. The large term will be of order one, and the rest will be of order one by h. So this model is an example of the first. Yeah, uh, I had one question again. The last plot you showed, kappa versus delta, I think, uh, is that independent of the transverse field you put in, that plot? Ah, okay. Okay, thank you. Maybe I... I make just a, a quick comment. It seems like a relevant story, which I heard from Israelis when, when they worked with Chirikov on the stability of the PU model, said that uh, with Chirikov, they figured out this criteria of overlapping resonances, basically where thermalization should stop. They did it in the first order and it worked amazingly well. So you just apply this criteria to FPU model and you see a very sharp threshold. Then they worked out second order. And in the second order, resonances appear everywhere because you have like, you know, Four frequencies, and they could never figure out, according to Israelov, why this is irrelevant. Because according to the second order, FPU should not be stable, but it's like extremely stable. In FPU, not that I know, and Chirikov was a very serious mathematician, so it's Not, not oh, okay. So your the structure of resonances which you showed up to the first order, and you showed that it amazingly fits very well. But I mean, how much? Usually the concern is like once you do perturbation, uh, the higher order results will definitely give some contributions. But your results matching exactly up to the first order. I mean, what what are the contributions from the second? I mean, how much it's stable against that? Uh, so a mathematician would tell you that uh, the expansion you have is asymptotic to a function, a well-behaved function, which only have isolated singularities. And you're, you're lucky that your series is asymptotic to the first order. So you capture the things, the first order from the second order, it's off. Like you see in all diverging perturbation theories in field theory. And you cannot take those terms seriously in this particular expansion. In this particular, okay, thank yeah. you. Questions, let's thank Arnav. Thank you.